Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Greg Williams, the master negotiator. I will tell you all about Greg in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is that program that focuses on what's all too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment we exert toward others. And when you do it as a leader, as you will discover that Greg very much is, you do it with uh, uh, to bring people together for common cause. Welcome, Greg Williams. So, thank you, John, and thank you for inviting me. Great. I want to tell everybody about you. Um, Greg, uh, Greg Williams is a uh, Harvard-trained negotiator with 30 years of negotiating experience, and he couples it with body language, in which he's an expert. So he um, uh, bills himself as the master negotiator and body language expert. He's taught negotiation skills, reading body language, in seminars to places all over, including our government, state government, federal government, you name it. He's also been a contributor to uh, major news networks uh, here in the U.S. as well as abroad. Um, he has written seven books on the topic, and he's got another one in the works. Um, he's been a member, like me, of Global Gurus, and he's also a member of uh, Marshall Goldsmith, 100 Coaches, where he is, uh, he and I have connected multiple times. And uh, anyway, it's a pleasure to have you on, Greg. Welcome. Well, I, I definitely appreciate the opportunity to expand upon the knowledge base of those that will tune in and see this particular session such that they can increase their negotiation and reading body language skills. Great. Greg, I'm going to ask you to, again, sorry to kick up your volume just a tiny bit, if you could, please. So, sure. Okay. Is there that we go. better? Yeah. Um, Greg, it's been, a, I am so happy to have you uh, um, speak about negotiation because that's a topic of which I don't do very well. In fact, I probably do a terrible job at it. So uh, what help can you give me? So before any negotiating session, where do you begin? What should you do, Greg? So you, you truly need to understand the person or entity with whom you are negotiating. That's to say, what are their likes? What are their dislikes? How might they respond in a particular situation based on what stimuli you might apply to them? Why are they negotiating with you? The more information you can gather ahead of time about what it is that will really motivate that individual or team to do one thing versus another, the better the chance you'll have of having a successful negotiation outcome. That sounds a little bit like I have to do homework. <laughs> Well, that's for sure. Definitely. So. <laughs> well, that's is is that a, a mistake that people make, um, Greg? They kind of go in and just wing it. So. That definitely is a mistake, John, because to the degree they are not prepared to negotiate, they put themselves at a lower probability of achieving that successful negotiation outcome that they seek. Uh, again, I reiterate about the fact that the more information you gather about the entity with whom you'll be negotiating, the greater the probability that you will have a successful negotiation outcome. So don't wake up the morning that a negotiation is supposed to occur and just run right into it. You're setting yourself up for a huge setback. Great. Well, what you talk about planning. What does it mean to plan for negotiation, Greg? So. And, and, and we've been delving into it thus far. Finding out from background information you can gather about the entity with whom you'll be negotiating, what it is that they've done in certain situations that's similar to the environment that you'll be negotiating in. What environment will you be negotiating? To what degree will that environment enhance or detract from your advantages or those with whom you'll be negotiating. How, have the, how, how has the other entity abided by the outcomes of an agreed settlement or negotiation in the past? Talk with those individuals, uh, with individuals that have negotiated with that particular entity to gain that insight. Okay, let's say you're negotiating face-to-face. -face. Well, who selects the environment is another concern because you're always negotiating. That's to say, it may seem petty to say one person has to choose a, an environment or one person wants to choose an environment, but, but therein lies the maneuver 
whereby that person is gaining somewhat of an advantage versus another. Okay. I, I like how you mentioned that because one of the secrets, I, I think there's maybe a pre-negotiation phase. And I think someone who was very, very good at it was um, um, our first president, Bush, Bush George H.W. And he, um, he was a people person. But one of the things he did, he was an ambassador to the UN um, and he made it an effort to go around and visit um other country, I mean, the ambassadors of other countries in their office. And that's something his son picked up on. But when you go to the other person's space, you are granting them respect. Is, does that ever play into negotiation, uh, Greg? So. Big, big time, big time. Not only are you in their environment, you're gathering insights based on what's in their environment about what's important to them also, or their character makeup. Take for uh, an example, someone that has pictures uh, of their family uh, all around their office, as opposed to someone that has objects all around their office. Well, you've just gleaned a little insight about the person that has pictures of his or her family, and that's something you can use during the negotiation. How might you use it, you might ask? Well, as you're talking in the pre-negotiation stage, that's to say when everyone is comfortable and just chit-chatting, mm -hmm. you might say something along the lines of, oh, you have a lovely family. How are they doing? Or something of that nature. You're displaying not only empathy, but the recognition of the fact that you're in someone's environment and that's important to that individual. So th that's one way to bond also with that individual before you start the official negotiation. I, I like that I can, because I know from, I'm a history buff and I do know from negotiations in history when people can develop a kind of chemistry, it, it does facilitate things. One of the things I do in, in uh, executive coaching, and I know you do too, Greg, is I coach managers to coach their employees. And one of the things I always do, and I think it's germane to negotiation, is what are what motivates them? How important is that if I'm sitting across the table from you, Greg, to know what makes you tick? So. And, and that's why gathering information ahead of time is so important. Because yeah. in some cases, and years ago, the banking industry would actually give promotions as opposed to giving someone a raise. And people walked around in the banking industry with the title of director, uh, AVP, SVP, et cetera, et cetera. And that was what really motivated them more so than money. And, and of course, if you knew that was the sole sort of motivation mm -hmm. in an environment, okay, so someone was threatening to leave, well, money might not be the source that motivates them to stay, but instead a title might be that. Yeah. And you know, you it's that, funny. It would give you an edge during the debate. When you're talking about this, when you were talking about an office, and I think this is true, is many times you go into a court. Well, once upon a time when we went in other people's offices, I don't know if this is true anymore, Greg, but anyway, uh, you, you talk about pictures on the wall. Very often you'll see plaques on the wall. And so that could be a point of reference. And it's just what you were talking about. That's not, you know, if you were the, you know, uh, in your community or a, a promotion in your company or recognize, you know, sales achievement or whatever the recognition is, um, that means something to that person. So that gives you an insight. Does it not, Greg? Oh, so. de definitely so. And it would behoove you to feed to that person's, let's call it ego, because they have plaques up there because they want recognition. And they yeah. sent you a silent signal by having that plaque on the wall to say just, just that, recognize me. So to the degree you do recognize them, once again, they start to like you. Yeah. And when it comes to negotiations, people like people that are like themselves. So if they see themselves reflected in you, they will tend to subliminally like you more, which should make the negotiations a lot easier than it otherwise would have been. Okay. It's not, I, I like how you're doing it. And you're talking about the human dynamic and we do, yeah, we want to associate with people we like, of course we do. But when 
you're negotiating on behalf of an organization. It isn't about you and it isn't about them. It's about organizational responsibilities. And I can think of the classic form of negotiation mm -hmm. as management and union, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, every three years, the United Auto Workers has this big table with the uh, executives of the union on one side and the executives of the, the corporate on the other side. And they begin with a traditional handshake, the CEO shakes hands with the union president, whatever it is. It's theater. It's all theater, you know, but uh, but it, it serves a role. So but it's each one. Uh, the parties may like one another personally, but they can't get personality involved. Am I right in that? Greg? So. Oh, oh, definitely so. And you know what? Let's expand upon that, John, because you have to understand where the power dynamics lie within the opposing negotiator, negotiators that you're negotiating with, and to what degree can you shift either that power towards you to be favorable to your position, and or to what degree can you use others on the other team to do so? So in the situation that you just mentioned a moment ago, the union may have the position that well, we need to show how tough we can be mm -hmm. such that management knows we're serious. Yeah. So let's say if management knew that going into the negotiation, management might say right off the top of the bat, okay, I understand that you guys are to be respected and we respect you. We want to work with you to achieve the outcome that you're seeking for your members. Can we start from that position? Now, what's the union members going? To, uh, union uh, folks that at the table going to say no? They're going to say <laughs> yeah, no. Right, yeah. And you've yeah. shifted the power dynamics right with that opening phase of the negotiation. It's, I like the term power dynamics. Does it also apply to? I'm negotiating with you, but you're really not. You're the proxy. So you are rep you're the representative in the union case, you're the representative of the, of the members, of course, but also there's some others where you're not really the you're the mouthpiece, not the not the power. So how do we figure that out, Greg? So. Well, for one thing, you test often and early by asking questions such as, so if we come upon an agreement, do you have the authority? to enter into it and the person and here's where body language comes in john let's say you're face to face and the person says uh, yes okay now you you may have noticed momentarily that i kind of hesitated before saying yes that slight delay in response signals something it could signal the person doesn't have full authority question to what degree he or she has authority, but picking up on that signal, you might want to reiterate the question. So if we come upon an agreement, you're saying you definitely have the authority to enter into it and no one else needs to be involved in this agreement. Is that correct? And observe what the person says at that particular point in time. So let's say you're negotiating different items as you enter deeper into the negotiation. Once again, you might want to come right back to the same question. So <laughs> I can do this for you. Can we come to an agreement? And are you the person to sign off on this? And get that person to constantly, consistently say yes and watch the body language. Because if the person says, well, I, I believe I can. Okay, now the dynamics have changed altogether. Yeah. And, and so one if, one if, if that though, John, let me add one so, more point to that. Because here's the other thing. There are times when you, as a negotiator, never want to place yourself in the position of having the final authority to sign off on an agreement. Why? Because you always want to give yourself room to rethink what has occurred up to a point in the negotiation, and you want to confer with others to assess how you might improve the negotiation be it on the other person's side or yours. Oh, great. And so if, if I'm, if I'm negotiating with you and, and I sense that you're not the final decision maker, do I play along or do I exploit that? 
It depends. And I will say that many a times in a negotiation, because in some cases, you can then turn that individual that has prompted him, uh, uh, propped himself up as the final uh, authority to sign off and say, well, but you told me all along you were the final authority. What, what, what's going on now? Oh, well, Greg, um, well, I have authority up to a certain level. Now, you should have tested that also, but then you say, you could say, okay, so let's drop back down to that level and you sign off on at, um, on where we are at that point. And the person says, uh, well, now you know you have even a larger problem. But still, at some point, if you know that person cannot make the final decision, you want to say, well, you know, I, I really respect you, John. And by all means, I have thoroughly enjoyed the negotiation process with you. So, okay, so you're propping the person up. Uh, John, so that we can reach an amicable outcome, can you please bring the person that does have the final authority into this negotiation? And then, John, you could say, well, yes, I will. Or if there's hesitation, I would then ask, John, you seem to be hesitating. Uh, may I ask why? Be respectful, too. Be respectful. I like that. So what is, um, I'm thinking that many of the people here um, listening to this were not going to be involved so much in, I'm going to say, uh, different party negotiation, but it's also the negotiation we have with members of our own organization. Uh, so what, what, what should, we, how should we enter those negotiations? Do all the same things play into that you had talked about? So. Well, they definitely do. And John, I'll tell a quick story. I had a client uh, that had three particular divisions within their organization negotiating against an outside entity for, uh, let's just say, an ingredient that this other company needed. And the three divisions within inside of this corporation were going at one another harder than they were going at the outside entity. Yeah. Why? Because each entity within the company that uh, I was representing was trying to carve out, carve out their own little prize, as it were, and they were fighting. They had a lot of infighting. So you yeah. definitely need to understand the dynamics that are occurring in any environment, especially in corporations where you have people trying to one, do the one-upsmanship on others. Oh, exactly. And that's where I kind of see the day to day negotiation. Of, um, and so I plan for it. I'm going into and I need to understand what the what motivates or what does this person want? What what topics? Is it cost? Is it quality? Is it prestige? Is it whatever? And then structure my argument that way. Am I on the right track, Greg? You are definitely on the right track and you're going in the right direction for sure. Because all of those components that you just mentioned are components that you definitely need to take into consideration. Because as we said a moment ago, there may be monetary outcomes may be the source that uh, motivates someone as opposed to getting recognition or having achieved a certain aspect in the negotiation. And the more you understand that person's dynamics, the greater you can assist that person in giving him or she what she or he needs such that they give you what you want. Okay. So, okay, let's come to the situation, be it, you know, uh, two companies negotiating or two divisions or two teammates, whatever it is. What do you do in case of impasse where it do, you just can't get any further? Uh, so what do you advise, Greg? So. Well, an impasse is a no. And a no only means no for the moment. You have to understand how you got there, and you should be tracking that all along throughout the whole negotiation process, and how you can keep it on track because you may want to pause it at that moment because it's not over. It may not be over. And the way you would exit at that point is to say, we seem to have reached an impasse right now. Can you please tell me how we might proceed in order to get the negotiation back on track or whatever verbiage that person uses to speak about that situation? But that's what you want. You want the perspective that individual has about the negotiation 
and take that person's suggestions about how to get it back on track to the degree that you can. Now, here's the point. Who can argue against themselves if they are the ones offering a solution that you adopt to the degree that you can? <laughs> Okay. Well, here's, I'm, I'm thinking of this as we're speaking. Is there a difference between a, a demand and a request and should? And so if I, I can think when I go into a negotiation, this is what I want or what my team wants, but it's how I phrase it. Am I, is, is that relevant, Greg? So. Oh, it, it's definitely relevant. John, yeah. let's take into, uh, let's create an example. I say to you, John, I have to have X as opposed to, John, I really would like to have X. Now, notice my body language also. I'm not, a, you know, to add emphasis on it. Notice the tonality of my voice as I spoke about having X the first time as opposed to the second time. And the verbiage. I have to have versus I'd like to have. All of those little nuances add to the perspective that individual is conveying his or her thoughts. You know, I think that just what you said in that, I have to have that. I think people go into, I'm thinking of inter, um, inter-organization negotiations where I think people start out with ultimatums <laughs> before. And so, I mean, no, no good can come out of two, two opposing ultimatums. Do you sense that? Uh, so. Well, that, that, that's for sure. Because yeah. if you start off at that point, where's the room to maneuver? You right. know, always try to keep your desires, your wants, your needs open such that, hey, we most likely never get 100% of what it is that we want in a negotiation. So even before you enter into it, you need to bracket your expected outcomes. So for example, if you get 80%, that may be more than what you thought you'd get and you'd be happy with it, 75%. Nevertheless, you need to know what you will be happy with and when it comes to that background gathering information we spoke of at the top of this session, having an expectation for what the other party will settle for gives you an advantage also. You have to know your dynamics and the parameters. And, and I think there's something, as you were speaking, what was coming into my mind, that, oh, I'd be satisfied with 75% or 80%. But you know, there's something in the human dynamic called ego, where I... Uh, I will say irrationally become, I have to have, it's either win, win or not. I mean, it's, I'm sorry, winner take all type mentality. How does one deal with that if you're on the other side? So. Well, first of all, you need to, once again, as the result of gathering background information, understand the dynamics that will work out throughout the negotiation and understand the person with whom you're negotiating. If that individual is a Win, lose, the only way I can win is to make sure that you lose type of individual. You need to be stern from the beginning. You need to let that individual know, well, hey, I know in the past, and you can be as blunt as this, in the past, I know you have accepted the mantra of win, lose. The only way you can win is if the uh, opposing negotiator loses. Well, I'm not that kind of person. So let's agree right now that we're going to be amicable and we're going to seek a win-win perspective. Are you in agreement? And wait, wait to hear exactly what that response happens to be. If the person says, hey, look, I'm going to get as much as I can out of this negotiation and I don't give a heck about what you get out of it. Okay, you're in a different negotiation environment at that particular point in time. And you should have strategies already created because at that point, depending upon how badly the opposing side needs what you want, you may actually say right at that point, well, you know what? I think we've reached an impasse. Well, what do you mean we reached an impasse? <laughs> you that out. Yes, but if we can't agree upon uh, negotiating amicably, I think we need to put this on pause until we can. So uh, in a sense, you're calling a bluff, but um, but also you, you touched on something and kind of and 
when you said wait for an answer. So I'm guessing, as we know, as you know, because you're a dynamic public speaker, the pause is often extraordinarily powerful. It's punctuation, all that. How important is the pause in negotiation? So. Oh, well, it, it, oh boy, let's let's use it right now. Yeah. Uh, so, and um, let me see. I'm going to set this up. I'm going to do something, John. I'll I'll phrase it that way. Okay. Sure. And I'll just use your name, but we don't have to go into a role play. Okay. Okay. So that's the setup. So I say something along the lines of, uh, John, you can have X or you can have Y. Okay, and I'll then, take that. And, and then, but and John, and then I pause momentarily, and then I say, or if you don't want X or Y, I may be able to offer A. You're you're negotiating against yourself, even though you gave that pause. You gave that pause. You did not pause long enough, and by throwing yet another option on the table, you start negotiating against yourself because. You don't know what the response might have been to just X or Y. And that's why a pause is not only important, but the fact that it should remain in that state until you get a response. Ah, okay. So is the pause going to be 15 seconds or is it going to be a minute I can, or what? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, because some yeah. people are more uncomfortable with a pause than others, and they'll just start talking. If they're uncomfortable yeah. with it, that, that's yeah. me. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Well, yeah. to increase your negotiation skills, sit there. They don't say yeah. a word. Don't say a word. I had uh, someone that I did become very, very friendly with initially when he and I were negotiating. We sat in a state of quietness for forty-five minutes, and I said to myself, "Okay, now let's see how we can break this." And now here's where um, breaking the silence also comes into play per how someone thinks. I said, I looked at my watch and I, I said, wow, it's getting late. And his response was, yes, it is. Yeah, we have broken the silence. Although we were referring to the negotiation in a subliminal manner, we were also talking about, hey, time is passing and progress is lacking at this particular point in time. Okay, do a fast forward. Later, after he and I really got to know one another, and he was the head of a corporate division of negotiators. And we, <laughs> we bounced back to that situation uh, that occurred at one particular point in time. And he said to me, you know, I was wondering how long it would take for you to say something. Because, as you know, the person that speaks first is the person that loses in a situation like that. I said, well, in reality, that's not really true. And he said, oh, why? I said, because if you think the person that speaks first is the one that loses, you think you have an advantage. And to the degree that I can control your thoughts, I really have the advantage. You know, power flows in a negotiation. And he was like, oh, my goodness. That's a lesson I have learned that I'll never forget. <laughs> Oh, that's a great one. Um, Greg, we are racing through this half hour as I knew we would. Uh, but, you know, I ask every guest a question about grace. So I'm asking you to share a story about grace. So. You know, John, you touched on it at the top of this session. Grace for me has been displayed to me just by being a member of 100 Coaches. Now, why do I say that? I've always attempted throughout my adult life to give back to as many people as I possibly can. And I don't ask for a thing. I really don't. And with 100 coaches, I've gotten to know you. I've gotten to know many of our associates. And the point is that God's grace shining on me from my perspective for being giving to others. And just like yourself, John, I do so to improve the lives of others such that the world can become a better place. Well, we certainly can use it now. And you are a good example of grace, Greg, because your reputation for generosity and sharing uh, precedes you. You are known as that type of person, a man of grace. So, Greg, how can people find you? <clears throat> well, they can reach me via email at Greg, that's G-R-E-G, -E at the, T-H-E, Master, M-A-S-T-E-R, Negotiator, N-E-G-O, 
T I A T O R dot com. They can also reach me at the master negotiator.com. And I have lots of free tips on my site that anyone can take to use to improve their lives. <laughs> That's great. Well, you've shared a lot of it too. And Greg, we will put the, your website in the notes so people don't even have to be able to spell. They'll just see it there. So anyway, uh, Greg, it's been a pleasure. And with that, we're going to close out. So.